Early December 2011. I just turned 11. And what was I doing? Well, everything I do now, minus the part where I do YouTube. Sonic Generations had just come out, and I couldn't get enough of it. But I was also replaying and finally finishing some of the games in a highlight franchise from my youth. Well, I guess I was still a youth in 2011, but you know what I mean. The point is, I was finally finishing Jack 2 and Jack 3. Because when I was a kid, I just bumbled around in the hub world instead of making real progress. I had no interest in Naughty Dog's direction towards more realistic games in the PS3 era. In fact, I had a bit of resentment towards the company at the time because they straight up abandoned the Jack and Daxter series when they had a lot of directions they could have taken it in. I mean, look at Insomniac, they're doing their Resistance series, which I have no interest in, but they're still giving the old fans more Ratchet and Clank. But now that Uncharted 3 was out, they might finally make a good game for once. Or so I was thinking at the time. But at the Video Game Awards, a new Naughty Dog game was announced. And it wasn't Jack 4. He tells me how these streets were crowded with people just going about their lives. <laughs> Must have been nice. The Last of Us, another realistic shooter game, and zombies are in it too? Now I'm really in trouble. I had no intention to play it from that day forward, so I never followed it after that. What was I following? Sly Cooper, Thieves in Time. Because that'll be one of the greatest games ever made! One eternity later. So now it's 2013, Sly 4 is out, and I thought it was awful. You could say I'm one of the lucky ones, because I discovered through hype for a stupid video game that sometimes life just doesn't go the way you want it to. Why am I telling you this in a video about The Last of Us, though? Well, hold on, I'll get to that. As if to cope with the pain of Sly 4's quality, I decided it was time to expand beyond my limited roster of video games. This is when I decided to give Naughty Dog's newer games a chance. After all, Naughty Dog has been giving me great games since I was a little kid playing Crash 2, Cortex Strikes Back, and Jack and Daxter, the precursor legacy on my PS2. How could it go wrong? Needless to say, I was hooked. The serious presentation, gripping story, exciting set pieces, it was exactly what I needed at the time, as well as my adventure itch being scratched by my first playthrough of Ocarina of Time 3D. You might now be asking why I would cover The Last of Us now instead of covering Naughty Dog's other games first, or at least the modern ones, as I divide Naughty Dog into three periods. The Nobody Cares era, where we toss the Rings of Power and Way of the Warriors type games, the Classic era with Crash 1 through Jack 3, and the modern era with Uncharted 1 to the present day, with Jack X serving as a bit of a transitional period as the company was switching gears in management, and it's also a game they seem to be ashamed of for some reason. Man, shooting race cars? The game is stupid. Couldn't tell you why, the game's pretty great. I had this great joke planned where I'd be like, yeah, I totally felt the need to review The Last of Us in May of 2020 for no reason, not trying to get topical clicks or anything at all. But then The Last of Us Part 2 winds up getting delayed indefinitely, so there goes that. But at the very least, I thought it would still be worth the effort to review the game now. That's because The Last of Us is a very special game to me. Which might come as a surprise to many of you, seeing as if you know where my general taste in games lie, you wouldn't think this. would be high on my list. Neither did I, quite frankly. It was when Brain Scratch Comms, one of my favorite YouTube channels from back when I was a kid, did their commentary on this game that I learned The Last of Us meant something to me. I found myself listening to the cutscenes while they were talking over it. When in the spring chapter, the part ending was so suspenseful that I couldn't wait until Monday to see what happened, so I watched the rest of the cutscenes on YouTube that Friday night. Like, I don't do that for games I don't care about. I knew I had to play it at that point. So when I got my PS4 for Christmas in 2014, The Last of Us Remastered was the first game I played on it. It was everything I thought it wouldn't be when I saw it first announced. This game hooked me from start to finish. It's a game where listening to certain tracks can make me tear up on command. A game where I care about the characters. A game where I shield my eyes while playing when getting a game over. But above all else, it's a game I knew I couldn't ruin. But what do I mean by ruin it? The term favorite game of all time is a pretty subjective thing, but almost every single game I would consider giving such a title have one thing in common. They left an emotional impact on me that I will never be able to let go of, or really describe in words. I'm pretty winded on the Metal Gear series still, but Metal Gear Solid 3 is still a favorite for me, for example. I have played Mega Man X and Sly 2 Band of Thieves so many times that every single playthrough blends in with the last five. Nothing really distinct about it, nothing to learn, nothing to see 
see, no new insights can be made. Nor can I experience it in the same way again because I've beaten those games into the ground so much. Even at the ripe age of 14, I knew The Last of Us was not a game I could let that happen to. I played it over winter of 2014, I played it a second time to give me something to do while Batman Arkham Knight was about to drop, and I literally did not touch the game again for three years when I played it in 2018 before the E3 trailer for The Last of Us Part 2 was going to drop, just to make sure my mind was clear on where I stood with the original Last of Us, and I haven't played it since before making this video. Which finally brings me back to the reason I need to review this game before the sequel comes out, and why I felt the need to play it again before the E3 trailer of 2018 came out. Because not only does The Last of Us mean a lot to me emotionally, but I have been saying since I first played the original in 2014 that a sequel to The Last of Us would likely be the kind of sequel that retroactively changes the first game. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing is a lot to execution, but I feel as though the ending of the first game will be different for fans of the series after the sequel comes out. So let's waste no more time. I'm here to tell you what The Last of Us means to me before it becomes a franchise. Well, more than it already was and there was only one game. Also, expect full spoilers. I don't know why you wouldn't, but there are some content consumers out there who never cease to amaze me no matter what precautions I put in place. In addition to that, this really isn't going to be much of a game review in the traditional sense where I discuss all the mechanics because for the longest time I never knew I would review this game one day. Now that the day is upon us, I had to seriously consider this question. While playing through the game, I made the executive decision not to focus on the gameplay much at all in this review outside of talking about this set piece or this amount of tension, you know, that kind of stuff. Mechanically, anything I could say about The Last of Us would just be really tacked on and forced. This is not a critique on the quality of the gameplay, I just don't have many meaningful things to say about it, and I have been trying to cut the fat out of my YouTube videos. One of the biggest issues I have with modern day gaming, as you might put it, is that most AAA games play exactly the same, or very similarly, which isn't a bad thing, because by this point the standards of what feels good to play have been firmly set in, so it makes sense. But gone are the days of, say, 2004, where you could go to the store to buy yourself some PS2 games and come back with MGS3, Sly 2, Ratchet 3, and Jack 3, four games that play nothing nothing alike, look nothing alike, and run on those completely different engines. In the six years between Uncharted, Drake's Fortune in 2007, and The Last of Us in 2013, third-person shooting in HD was just nailed to a T. Any problems I could bring up in a review of Uncharted are just not things I have to say in this game. Naughty Dog has always been obsessed with quality assurance, so the game plays as well as a AAA 2013 game could. The controls are fluid, intuitive, and responsive, shooting feels exactly how you'd expect it to, gathering supplies and crafting things is fun and encourage you to look around the areas, and yeah, see what I mean? Let's get on with it. The ending is the main point of contention when making this review a necessity before the new game comes out. Whenever it does, that is. You all know the one. Swear to me that everything that you've said about the Fireflies is true. I swear. This ending is one of my favorites in gaming. The timing of the amazing credits music is just beautiful, to the point where every time I get here I have to just stop and reflect on the journey it took to get here, and I always tear up over it. So the main thing going on in this game is that the Cordyceps virus has had a stranglehold over humanity for 20 years, but Ellie is somehow immune to the transformation, and a militia group called the Fireflies want to study her to see if they can create a vaccine, with Joel having to be the one to get her from Boston to Salt Lake City. However, because of Joel's tragic past where he lost his daughter right in front of his eyes when the virus outbreak first happened, he's cold towards Ellie at the beginning, but by the end, can't and won't let her go. Marlene, the leader of the Fireflies, is going through a lot as she promised Ellie's mother that she would look after her, but is now having to sacrifice her life for the cause of saving the world from the infected. Joel decides that he isn't going to let them try to find a cure from her, kills most of the Fireflies, takes Ellie away from the facility, where she's still out from the anesthetics, and tells a complete lie as to what happens so they can keep living a life together with her as a surrogate daughter for him. What the right thing to do here is something I've never really reached a definitive conclusion on, because despite the lie Joel tells Ellie, Turns out there's a whole lot more like you, Ellie. People that are immune. There's dozens, actually. Ain't time a damn bit of good, neither. They've actually... They've stopped looking for a cure. That's just not true. Find someone else. There is no one else. Listen, you were gonna show me where... <clears throat> Stop. From my understanding, it's not even really a guarantee that studying Ellie's condition would even be a success. The Fireflies are going to make an attempt to find out what causes her immunity and reverse engineer a vaccine from that. It's a guarantee that Ellie, this lovable character, would die as the virus grows all over the brain, but there is a chance that this whole thing doesn't work and her unknowing sacrifice would be in vain. 
That's just my hypothesizing though, because Joel's actions are not driven by anything other than the selfish need to not lose another daughter. I say selfish, and that makes it sound villainous, which some people do argue that Joel is the villain of the story. But this is why I say I just don't know. Because on an objective stance, Marlene and the Fireflies want to use Ellie for the potential to save mankind from the virus that has overtaken almost all of society. Joel is being selfish as he's trying to benefit himself by keeping her alive, because he does love and care about her, and while we can say it's wrong to take mankind's potential salvation away, but Joel's actions just make so much sense given what he's been through. Like I said, he watched his daughter die and he wasn't able to save her and had spent the next 20 years surviving in spite of that fact. Now that he and Ellie grew so much in this life or death journey across the country, and he has the ability to save her, so he isn't going to stand by and suffer another loss like that, as I'm sure it's no coincidence that the first time we play as Joel is carrying his daughter Sarah throughout the city as the outbreak just began, almost making it to safety, but failing. And the last time we play as him is carrying Ellie out of this hospital with armed guards hot on your trail with such a high chance of dying and making it. I won't definitively call Joel a villain because I just understand his motivations too well to say that. Now, villains can have motivations you understand and still be clear villains, but my point is more that this is such a shitty world that makes the best of people shitty. And having been in control of Joel throughout this whole journey, caring about Ellie from the beginning to now, you feel like you're in his shoes when doing that final hospital section. Or at least, that's what I felt like. But there is no arguing against what Marlene says here. It's what she'd want. This really is what Ellie would want. Like she says here. Be done with this whole damn thing. After all we've been through. Everything that I've done. It can't be for nothing. All the death and murder and close calls they witnessed couldn't be for nothing. That and the ending also shows that she feels like sacrificing herself for a potential cure is what she, in a way, deserves for having been the one to live through all these things, while so many others didn't. My best friend was there. And she got bit too. We didn't know what to do. So... She says... Let's just wait it out. You know, we can be all poetic and just lose our minds together. I'm still waiting for my turn. Ellie. Her name was Riley, and she was the first to die. And then it was Tess. And then Sam. None of that is on you. No, you don't understand. I struggled for a long time with surviving. Which brings me to that superb final line. I swear. The game ends there for a reason. I wouldn't call it a cliffhanger, it's more like it's up to your own interpretation as to what okay means. Ellie was unconscious for the entire final act of the gameplay, so she has no way of knowing if what he said about the Fireflies was true, which it isn't. Probably another reason why Joel killed Marlene, just to make sure she could never learn the truth, which is pretty fucked up. But she clearly wasn't entirely comfortable with what he said as she asked him to swear if it was true. Does okay mean I believe you? Does it mean I don't believe you, but this is the logic we're going to work with going forward for the sake of keeping life as peaceful as possible? Does it mean, okay, you're an asshole and I hope to escape from your presence as soon as humanly possible? Or some other meaning in between those? You can't say for sure just looking at The Last of Us Part 1. Joel being in the sequel does lead me to think it's definitely not the third option I presented, but as I have avoided all marketing for that game, I don't know what direction this character is going to go in at this current moment. But do you see what I mean? The ambiguity of it, the moral grays, the personal interpretations, a sequel like The Last of Us Part II has the potential to give a more definitive answer on what okay means, and I thought it was important to make a video saying why I feel this ending so emotionally impactful before that happens. Just to clarify again, I'm not against a sequel doing that, in fact I want it to happen because that would make things more interesting, but still the beauty of the original ending needed to be discussed. Not that it hasn't already been a million times on YouTube, but this is one of my favorite games ever, you can't expect me to just not make a video on it. Now that I've discussed the ending, let's backtrack and get to the what this game means to me ideas. By going back to the beginning of the game, if there's one thing I've personally struggled with, it's living life to the fullest in the time we have. How does this play a role into The Last of Us though, you might ask? Well, because we never know just how much time we have until it's over. 
I have no idea if this was supposed to be a theme in this story, but it's something I extracted meaning from throughout all my playthroughs. Many of life's moments are just normal, and can be turned on their head and ruined in an instant. That's what the whole prologue of the game is there to establish. Joel lives his normal life, struggling with the mortgage, living with his daughter, and then the outbreak happens. You never really think to yourself, no matter how bad things are getting out there, that it will happen to you. Just listen to this dialogue between Joel and Sarah. Are we sick? No, of course not. Of course we aren't infected. Now, none of them got infected, but the plan was to drive out of the city, as if everyone else hadn't already thought of that, and right when you least expect it, Sarah is shot and killed. I mean, this started as a normal day, but the whole world went to hell and back before the day was done. I don't know if this means anything to you guys, but that sort of thing just really gets to me, as we never do know what's around the corner. All we can do is try to make the journey there one that was well spent and done without regret, which I think applies to other areas of the story, like the portion where Joel and Ellie team up with Sam and Henry ending in their tragic deaths. Or how Joel wasn't going to live in regret for not saving Ellie, so he takes action to make sure that doesn't happen. This game is just such a great story about people and their interactions, and that's why I love it so much. I might rationalize Joel having done terrible things in his past because, oh, he's gone through so much having seen Sarah die in his arms and all that, but who is to say that all the people we slaughter, who are trying to slaughter us as well, aren't also people who have seen a lot of heartbreaking and terrible shit as well? Does that forgive the actions Joel has taken when he was one of the people we might call the bad guys in the game? How did you know? Know what? About the ambush. I've been on both sides. Oh. So, uh, kill a lot of innocent people? Uh, I'll take that as a yes. Take it however you want. That's entirely up to you. I'm admittedly not someone particularly well-versed in the post-apocalypse zombie world, so maybe these sorts of dilemmas are a cliché, I wouldn't really know for sure. All I know is that every time I play The Last of Us, I just get lost in it. When playing other games I love, sometimes I might need to watch a show or watch some YouTube videos in the background to have something else to think about beyond mashing the buttons. This is a game that gets my full undivided attention each and every playthrough, which like I said towards the beginning, is weird coming from me, since the gameplay, when not in combat or stealth events, is just walking around and picking stuff up. How can I get lost in this, but not wall jumping and doing least backtracking runs as Mega Man X, getting A ranks in Sonic Adventure 2, or chaining those combos as Zero or Dante? The answer is just the human emotions in Joel and Ellie as their journey is so real and believable, and I don't want to miss a single moment of it, like this part with look at the torn up movie poster. These posters are everywhere. I saw this right before the outbreak. You did? Does he totally gut her by the end? <laughs> Nobody gets gutted, it's a, it's a dumb teen movie. Who dragged you to see it, then? I don't know. Let's just stay focused, all right? The Last of Us being such a popular game definitely had something to do with the amount of zombie apocalypse games, and that's often something you might hear about this game. Oh, it's just another zombie game with an abundance of emotional gut punches to get people to look past that fact, but that's something I can't agree with. I know I said I don't experience stories like this all that often, but I feel like the infected are one of the least important aspects of this game. If The Last of Us was a game about mutant space aliens from Saturn IV establishing themselves as the new dominant race on Earth as 60% of the human race is wiped out, leaving these zones that the military keeps the aliens out of, and the Fireflies fighting against the establishment to develop a bioweapon that can kill the aliens for good from a girl that survived an alien attack, it would basically be the exact same story. Same tensions with other human beings, same scary, heart-pounding moments with the zombies slash aliens, same beautiful moments to pause and reflect on everything that happened. Like here in the spring. This moment can last as long as you want it to, and I always take the opportunity to stop and think about all the characters the player will have seen and dealt with from the start of the journey to the finish line. The gratifying emotional toll it takes on you to experience it all. As far as the threat is concerned, I think the infected do a great job at ramping the tension up whenever they appear. I think it's pretty annoying how when a clicker grabs you, sometimes without you even being able to do anything about it, it's a guaranteed death until you upgrade the shivs, but my point is, the Cordyceps virus being a real thing that exists in the ant population is such a scary thought because the concept of the game isn't, what if zombies were real? It's, what if a real life condition came to the human population? What would we do? A virus that overtakes the mind of the host, causing them to lose themselves to the will of the fungus. It's gross and horrifying to think about the process of going from a normal person, to a runner, to a stalker, to a clicker, or god forbid a bloater. Whenever I see these monstrosities make a desperation dash towards me, my heart will always skip a beat. The lore based around this is just so well realized that it keeps me on the edge of my seat whenever they're around. The unpredictability of the story is also another reason why I can't get enough of it. 
But how could I possibly use the word unpredictable to describe this post-apocalyptic zombie game, though? Well, it's because you never do know what's gonna happen. When you buy the game, you know you're getting a journey between Joel and Ellie across the country. But what about the journey there? Characters that are likable and with such diverse personalities like Tess, Bill, Henry, and Sam, Tommy, and his wife Maria, what will the fates of these characters be? Tess gets infected and this is when Joel is forced to believe Ellie's immunity to the virus and her last moments are so genuine. Guess what? We're shitty people, Joel. It's been that way for a long time. No, we are survivors! This is our chance! It is over, Tess! But she goes out buying them some time for the military. Bill actually doesn't die at all and just tells you to get the fuck out of his town. But there is heartbreak and world building even there with his partner Frank disappearing but having died through suicide because he got infected. In the house, you can find Frank's last letter to Bill if he ever finds it, saying that he's glad he's going to die because that's better than spending another day with Bill. The player has the option of giving this to Bill, but I always choose not to. Henry and Sam do start to click with Joel and Elliot, and after some surprising drama that separates them for a brief moment, they get over it, and it becomes a really entertaining dynamic that the four have. But Sam gets infected, and Henry kills his younger brother. <laughs> Shit! Really? Gotta go real right. Uh -huh. Oh my god. Sam? Oh no. Sam? Henry? <gasps> Ellie, stay there. Henry? Uh, what have you done? I'm gonna get that gun from me, okay? Sam. Oh, okay, okay, easy. Is it your fault? This is nobody's fault, Henry. It's all your fault! Henry! Henry, no! <laughs> It's just so awful, but meaningful to watch and play. Tommy and his people have actually started to find ways to move society forward, and this is the most optimistic part of the game, as nobody we care about here dies at all. But the drama comes from Joel and Tommy's undealt with baggage. I got nothing but nightmares from those years. You survived because of me! It wasn't worth it. Or Ellie running away at this point. Running off like that, putting yourself at risk? It's pretty goddamn stupid. Well, I guess we're both disappointed with each other then. See what I mean? Unpredictable. I also like little areas with life packed to the brim you travel through, which sounds weird to say because there is no life here at all, which is what leads to nature taking its hold back over the structures mankind tore nature down to build. But inside the areas, you see little things like this letter that Ezra left for Rachel. He can't wait for her any longer and hopes they see each other in the quarantine zone. It makes me sad because that probably never happened. Or these recordings people on their deathbeds have left, like this guy in the vent in a left behind DLC level. Or the biggest example, the whole society that Joel, Ellie, Henry, and Sam find in the sewers. This place feels so lived in and tragic as they thought they could hold down the fort but failed. There were children here too, with rules about no running or loud noises posted on the walls, toys and beds scattered around, a classroom with basic knowledge on there, but they clearly never got to finish it. But all it takes is one slip up and this guy was left with him and the children and a pack of infected banging on the door, with the words, they didn't suffer, scrawled on the floor. I don't see it as trying to elicit emotions from the player artificially, I see this as a screwed up world that makes good people bad and inherently bad people flourishing, or good people dying before they could become bad. When you hit the winter chapter, Joel has suffered a big injury and now the player must take control of Ellie trying to survive. They did such a great job with this. As Ellie, you don't have all the weapons that Joel did, and you can't just beat these guys up with your bare hands, you're playing as a 14 year old kid against the infected and an army. You just feel less powerful, but you press on anyway. They did phenomenal work with the characters here. As per usual, you run into new characters to tag along with, David and his crew. He's just so wonderfully creepy from the first second, but you don't really have a choice but to trust him anyway since there's no other way for Joel to get the medicine he needs. Like, you feel everything Ellie must be feeling as he talks in this slow, ominous voice, especially at the moment where he says this. Sent a group of men out, a nearby town to look for food. Only a few came back. He said that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. And get this, he's a crazy man traveling with a little girl. You see, everything happens for a reason. Who would have guessed the army of humans we've been fighting have a leader and here he is. This maniac who cuts up humans and serves them to his people. The guy who tries to manipulate Elliot every turn in the most unsettling of ways leading to one of my favorite encounters in gaming. 
the restaurant stealth section with Ellie and David, as you just feel disturbed as he's talking about having no idea what he's capable of. This is where Joel's love towards Ellie finally hits a high as he stops at nothing to get her back from these people after she's captured. And when they do reunite, I just feel a swell of emotions I can't really put into words. This has just always been my favorite cutscene in the game, which is high praise. Stop! Stop! Fucking duck me! It's okay, it's me! It's me! It's me! Look, look! It's me. He tried to... Oh, baby girl. It's okay. It's okay. No. It's okay. These cutscenes are just so freaking amazing, with phenomenal motion capture work and sheer acting chops from numerous talents that got involved in the project. I bring this up because other games like, say, Batman Arkham Origins will have the cast do their voiceover in the studio, but then just have motion capture actors sync up with the recorded voiceover. There's a lot of talent that goes into that, I'm already well aware, with it being kind of sad that when games like that get brought up, the voice talent's easy to recognize, but the mocap actors often don't get the credit they deserve. But ever since Uncharted 1, Naughty Dog has always been distinctive with their direction. Troy Baker is Joel. Ashley Johnson is Ellie. These actors are in a giant white room in these ridiculous dotted jumpers, but pull off performances as real as this. He used to run with this crew, he'll know where to go. No, 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 that was your crusade. I am not doing that. Yes, you are. Look, there's enough here that you have to feel some sort of obligation to me, so you get her to Tommy's. Well, then what the hell is plan B? You ought to be thankful you're still drawing breath. That was plan A, B, C, all the way to fucking Z. And furthermore, tell Tess that she could take don't this you job. Don't you bring Tess shove it right up nothing to do with So don't tell me that I would be safer with someone else, because the truth is I would just be more scared. You're right. You're not my daughter. And I sure as hell ain't your dad. And the facial expressions and the bodily movements, it's all in the actors and their performances in these silly suits and white rooms. On the subject of Ellie's character though, I think most would agree that she steals the show for a vast majority of the game. Her wit and fun-loving attitude in these horrific times is just so endearing in the early parts of the game, but it's once you reach winter that it's impossible for her not to be an instant gaming icon. Like, I was just describing how awful and creepy David is, but Ellie's not someone who got captured and needs Joel's rescue. She got captured in the first place because she wanted to lead these assholes away from recovering Joel. She steps up and has to act on the spot when around this complete freak, which would paralyze a lot of people, at least it would me if I were her. She kills a lot of them before being caught as well, and when that does happen, she does everything she can to try and survive. It's courageous to watch, because courage is not action in the absence of fear. Courage is action in the face of it which describes these seemingly hopeless sections of gameplay to a T. When it's all said and done, Ellie and Joel have actually switched roles in the spring chapter as she's kind of distant, he's the one with life in him. That is, until they see the giraffes and we get that breather moment. Which brings me to the final point I want to make about this game. The Left Behind DLC mission shows off Ellie's courage even more as we play as her in time between the fall and winter sections, facing off against deadly traps, infected, and hunters. Not giving up no matter what. She's seen so many people die and is determined to save Joel. It's such a heartwarming watch. I'm not letting you go. I'm not letting you go. This is combined with flashbacks that took place before the story began, as we see Ellie and her friend Riley before they got infected, which is when this happened. The tension between these two was rising throughout their segments of gameplay, and this was the culmination of that. I don't usually like to talk about more serious subjects on my show, but I need to explain why I love what this part stands for and means to people. When I first played this game, I was 14, so while I considered myself progressive, I still thought some dumb stuff, like, what is this for? If you want good representation, make it subtle, like Bill's sexuality that's more implied than said. This is basically the common argument you hear of, I don't mind diversity, I just don't want it forced upon me. Which is the entertainment version of, I don't mind LGBT people, just don't do it around me. This is a flawed idea inherently because it means certain people have to hide themselves in certain contexts and that's just the prejudice people are out there fighting to put an end to. I've grown up a lot since I was a young idiot and I think this revelation for Ellie's already well fleshed out character is great. As a straight person myself, this part doesn't speak to me per se. However, listen to this clip of Ashley Johnson discussing the matter on a panel with Troy Baker and Greg Miller. 
this one girl in particular, and I was just talking about her the other day, and I cannot remember her name. And she posted the video, and it was her playthrough, and her first realization is when they're in the photo booth. And she's watching, and she, she you know, put her hand over her mouth, and she goes, oh, wait a minute. And then, like, as it, as it went on, and then, you know, after the kiss, and she just broke down, and she paused, and she's like, I gotta stop this for a second. If I would have been able to play this when I, when I was this age, this would have made life easier for me. And I just completely broke. Like, the reason I love The Last of Us is because of the emotional journey that leaves an unending, lasting impression on me. Other people who struggle with their identity have found solidarity with this already great character, and the fact that other people get meaning out of the game in their own way, like I have for other aforementioned reasons, means a lot to me, and that's why I love this game so much. This is what diversity is good for, especially for those of a young age. It just normalizes people who might seem different, but in reality are just layered, complex people like everybody else is. And that is what The Last of Us means to me. I don't care that the sniper in the house has this magical aim that can never miss when there's nobody in the house. I don't care that I find pushing objects around to handle a bit clunkily. I don't care that there's always a convenient wooden board for Ellie to ride in water sections or how in the winter escape, this enemy got killed, warped out of existence, and then popped back in. Or how Joel on some set pieces now magically has infinite ammo. Or hell, even if there was some feature in the pre-release that didn't pan out as well in the final product as was hyped up before. This is a fucking amazing game with a gripping story, production values that still feel brand new, gameplay and mechanics that are just the same. The thing about The Last of Us is that it takes gameplay that was prominent throughout the seventh generation and the kind of gameplay Naughty Dog had been perfecting throughout the Uncharted trilogy and made something really special and new out of it with the survival scavenger aspect of it. Thank God they abandoned the Jack 4 they were going to do in favor of this. I hope The Last of Us 2 plays even better than the original, but I genuinely think that The Last of Us is one of the greatest games ever made. Four playthroughs later and I still chuckle at the little jokes, be immersed in the world of all these characters, and as I've drilled in, continue getting tears in my eyes at all these same points each and every playthrough. Get emotional on command the second you play a few brief snippets of the soundtrack. The Last of Us doesn't have the obvious gamey appeal that other games I like do, as I'm willing to admit, but my bond with this game is something truly special that I cannot really put into any other words that I haven't already. Having finally finished this video feels like the last rite of passage for me as a YouTuber. I mean, I've tried to do justice to Sly Cooper multiple times with varying success, but I reviewed Sly 4, the game that convinced me I needed to do YouTube in the first place, I got through the whole Mega Man X and Zero series, I did the entire Metal Gear saga, the whole DC animated universe with a frickin' 5 hour review of Justice League Season 2, but meanwhile, this like 30 minute video on The Last of Us just manages to be the one where I look and think, yeah, if I can articulate why I love this game in a way that I'll be able to look back on in several years and think I did a good job on, truly means that on YouTube, I can do just about anything I set out to achieve. <laughs>